Well, we now come to the uh, Powering Africa section. And um, I can't think of many more important things than power in Africa. There are many challenges, but perhaps power should be at the top of the list. And we have a keynote here, which will be delivered by Mr. Okechukwu Maba, the general manager commercial at Seplat Petroleum Development Company. Sadly, I don't have Mr. Maba's CV, so I can't do him the honor of giving him a full introduction. But Mr. Maba, you're very welcome. Please come forward, if you will. I'm sorry, Mrs. Nomachuku. Welcome. Uh, thank you. I surely don't look like a man. <laughs> but, no. <laughs> thank you. OK. Um, uh, first of all, good afternoon, His Excellency, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And I must thank the gentleman in the crowd, Abu Bakr, who asked the question about Seplat. And the Buku, of course, for giving that uh, very many details about the company I represent. I'm here today to represent my chairman, Dr. ABC Ojako, and it's a great honor for me to be here to represent him to give his keynote address. He actually really apologized for not being able to attend, and um, sends his good wishes that we have, he believes that this will be a great outcome for this event. So now permit me please to use a couple of minutes to read his keynote address to this distinguished crowd. It is always a great pleasure visiting the London School of Economics and interacting with the energetic and brilliant faculty of this institution, enthusiastic students, and the London business community. Our conversation today is on a highly important subject matter which impacts directly on Africa's progress and indeed on the global economy, sustainable power and energy and wealth creation. My warm appreciation and gratitude to the organizers of this conference for giving me the privilege to deliver this keynote address. I titled this keynote, Powering Africa, Laying the Foundation for Africa's Industrial Age. In recognition of the fact that power is not an end in itself, but a means to driving the industrialization and creating a secured future of wealth and prosperity for the continent. The realization of this is both an incentive and motivation for the public and private sectors, which includes all of us gathered here today, to work together, together on solving the power problem in Africa. Innovation in energy sources from fissile fuels to the natural energy and nuclear power was at the heart of Western industrialization of the 19th and 20th century, which transformed Western Europe and America into paragons of efficiency and productivity and fostered decades of wealth generation. The Asian region has latched onto this pioneering success of the West with their unique growth models to build energy infrastructure, group powering a generation of extraordinary wealth and uh, growth and wealth creation. Imagine Asia today has become the manufacturing hub of the world, producing everything from garments to smartphones to solar panels to gas turbines, helping to lift estimated millions of people from poverty into a middle income level. But the reason we are here today and discussing this subject is because Sub-Saharan Africa has for long been behind the curve in energy production and consumption. Today, electrification rate is below 50% in Africa. Much lower in rural areas where we have only one in four people have access to electricity. 33 African countries ranked in the bottom 50 of the World Bank Index on getting electricity. Electricity power consumption was 488 kilowatt hour per capita in sub-Saharan region in 2013, 
the global average was six times in multiples the same year. 53% of people without electricity in the world are in Africa, a region with only 15% global population distribution. Excluding South Africa, the numbers become even less flattering. According to the African Development Bank, South Africa accounts for two-thirds of sub-Saharan Africans' 68 gigawatt installed power capacity, leaving the rest of the region 800 million strong with only 25 gigawatt of electricity. There are more damning facts, but as objective of this conference and the next panel, what is important is to offer perspectives on the reasons the, re the region is lagging in, lacking in capacity and consumption, as well as to suggest possible pathways forward. The prevalent inadequate capacity is closely linked to the energy market structure that was prevalent in the region for much of the last century and the decade, which is both a cause and effect of inadequate investment in the sector. For many years, power infrastructure was closely owned and operated by public agencies whose investment in the value chain did not move at the pace of population growth. The inefficiency in governance, despite huge income from commodity view, weakness in the past two, two decades, ensured the sector was served of much needed investments. Whilst the private sector, both domestic and foreign, lacking in incentive in the inefficient structure, failed to participate in the sector to bridge the gap. Despite these grim realities of the current situation, there are still reasons to be happy with what the future foretells. A generational and structural shift in power sector structure from one formerly controlled by government to one gradually opening up to private sector investments and development agencies funding and participation is underway in sub-Saharan Africa. Political and economic leaders in the region are liberalizing the sector and decentralizing economic sources. This allows for innovation and entrepreneurship to strive while reducing the operational role of government. It was interesting listening to the last panel. It was you know, very well highlighted that government has his or its hands in everything. But what we are saying in the power sector is the government is gradually allowing the private sector to play a key role. However, the public-private partnership model remains a veritable platform to achieve the overarching objective, and Nigeria has taken this important step in a decade-long reform, which is still continuing. While challenges still exist, that we are on the, on the right path is in no doubt. Industry players desire more market-oriented mechanism to be transparently <coughs> deployed in pricing system across the value chain to reflect appropriate cost of production from the pricing of gas, which is an important uh, input in generation, to retailing pricing at the distribution stage. To the private sector decision makers gathered here today, wise challenges such as the current, uh, current physical and foreign exchange challenges, which was also highlighted in the last session, exist in the region, opportunities still abroad. <coughs> The opportunities in infrastructure which remain long term. Political reforms also, which ensure sustainability of the investment environment, have thankfully gained foothold as seen in the peaceful political transitions weakness in the region over the last two years. Some interesting developments in the sector is also worthy of note. There are laudable private sector and development partner led initiatives collaborating in many ways to making African dream of electricity access and sustainable development come true, defying the often quoted institutional challenges of investing in Africa. Some of this include the multilateral investment guarantee agency and the partial risk guarantee funding of the World Bank. The US Power Africa program uh, and the New Deal on Energy for Africa initiative of African Development Bank which has an ambitious ob objective of connecting 205 million individuals in the region to electricity sources in 2025. One of the many products of the collaborative efforts 
we are seeing between the private and, sec and public sectors, for example, in Nigeria, is the Azora Edo Independent Power Project, a 450 megawatt open cycle gas turbine power project in Edo State of Nigeria. It, is, it was part or is partially funded and insured by World Bank, by World Bank agencies, and in 20, uh, 2014, Seplat and Azura did sign a gas purchase agreement for a sum of $750 million. This gas plant is expected to give, again, 450 megawatts of power to drive the boost and boost the, the nation's power sector. This will come into be in existence in 2018. For us as Seplat, we have accelerated and dev the development of our gas production and producing capacity to meet the growing need for the domestic market, particularly the power industry. For us, supplying gas to meet Nigerian domestic needs is both a commitment, an opportunity, and a priority. Seplat currently produces 300 scuffles of gas, contributing about 40% to the nation's power grid. Plans are also on the way to increase our gas processing capacity to 525 megawatts by 2016. Our commitment to gas development is significantly providing clean fuel to power, facilitating job creation, and creating value for our various stakeholders. In concluding this keynote address, let me stress that empowering Africa, the need for collaborative local and international capital investments remains a necessity. As a result, African governments must continue to create the right policies and provide the needed support that will encourage investors in taking the bold steps to invest in Africa. I thank you for listening and wish all of us a very successful deliberation. Thank you very much, Madam, and uh, may I ask members of this panel to please take their seats. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This is our third panel of the day, focusing on uh, powering Africa. The low levels of electricity generation, high dependence on carbon-based energy sources, and the lack of power distribution infrastructure have been identified as one of the most pressing challenges for the future of economic growth in Africa. However, the advancement and growth of the renewable energy sector, as well as the income generation capacity of the traditional energy export industries, also present vast opportunities for both international and African businesses, as well as African governments. In the light of these challenges and opportunities, our panel will take an in-depth look at a wide variety of issues surrounding the African energy sector and will address pressing questions such as how can we effectively and sustainably power Africa in the age of a global shift away from carbon-based energy sources? What is needed to build up the necessary power infrastructure to foster industrialization and economic growth? And what role will traditional and renewable energy producers, as well as domestic and regional government actors play in the future of the African power sector? How technology may not be a panacea for Africa's ills, and rather how individuals and communities, as well as governments and businesses, can leverage it most effectively. 
Our moderator for this panel is Mr. Martin Bratt. Martin, over to you. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Microphones are on point. That's good to know. Um, and thank you um, also to Mrs. Nachoku for uh, giving a very, um, very nice introduction to the topics that we'll be discussing today. I think she, in her keynote speech, touched on a number of different uh, issues that are absolutely critical uh, to understanding the challenges and the opportunities of the African energy sector. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel here today, and I am very pleased uh, to be able to chair that. Just by way of introduction, um, I think we've, we've already heard it a couple of times, and, and most of you are familiar uh, with the situation um, on the continent, so there is no, it's no surprise that energy uh, power is one of the major binding constraints to growth um, on the African continent. Um, consumption is very low in most countries. Um, too few people are connected to the network, so electrification rates are overall very low. And even when people are connected, often there is no power. So you know, it's not helpful to be connected to the grid if, if effectively you have access to electricity 15 minutes a day. So this is the challenging situation. Um, you know, uh, McKinsey recently published um, a report called uh, Brighter Africa, which I will, of course, encourage all of you to read, um, le which looks at the overall opportunities um, of the sector and, and the, the expe expected growth in, in power consumption and power production on the African continent. That report foresees a quadrupling of generation by, by 2040, and I think in that in many ways will not be nearly enough to get close to the targets that have been announced um, by, by Professor Adesina at the AFTB and by other people um, prominent in the sector. So the challenge is real. At the same time, there are exciting things happening, and it is a time of change in the energy sector in Africa. If you look at how things are today compared to where they were five or ten years ago, I think we are looking at a radically different picture. Um, Technology has changed, um, and input prices have, have radically changed. I think the, the obvious example of this is the cost of, of installed uh, solar capacity, which makes it a lot cheaper and, in many cases, um, fully profitable to generate uh, energy from, from, from solar. Um, the other thing that is happening is, is the, the price of gas. Now, this is, a, this is a real problem, obviously, for gas exporting countries like Tanzania or like Mozambique. But for other countries, the fact that natural gas prices have come down so far is a real opportunity to power their domestic sectors rather than focus on, 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 on LNG exports or, or other things. Um, there is a lot of investment, and I think it was very interesting to listen to the, to the panel that was just before us, and I think their points, which, which are, I fully, fully agree with, and I think it was, um, it was the gentleman from, from Standard Charter who made, made it very clearly, is that the problem isn't capital. As a matter of fact, there is a lot of investment chasing opportunities in, in the African, uh, in the African, on the African continent, and specifically in the infrastructure space. And so much money is available if you can find and craft the right types of investment deals. Finally, there are some really exciting and interesting business models that are, co that are coming out. I think um, uh, those of you from, from Kenya hey, may be familiar with the MCOPA model of distributed solar. There, there are really, really exciting opportunities where you're seeing an, a, a more than exponential growth in distributed solar um, installations ar around the continent, driven by technology, but also by kind of clever people figuring out the business model to, to make this work. Anyway, these are some, so there are challenges but there are also real opportunities. And I have an exciting panel with me here today um, to, to discuss these different things. Um, to my immediate right is uh, Mr. Howard Barry. He is a lawyer, um, currently working with Eversheds. He's got broad experience from project development and project finance in Africa, and is currently working on, on a number of, region, of, of renewable energy projects across the continent. Mr. Mr. Remy Makumbe is, um, uh, is a, a distinguished representative from the Southern African Development Community. One of the really more interesting examples of regional cooperation, which I think is, 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 a, is an absolutely critical topic. Africa has you know, more than 50 different nations, and it may not be that the most cost-effective solution here is for everyone to have to be purely self-sufficient in, in, in energy provision. And so the regional opportunities are, are very interesting. We then have uh, Dr. Ernest uh, Azudialu Jesse. I think I got that more or less right, um, who is the president and GMD of the Ovi Jackson Group of Companies in Nigeria, which works across the energy space, both in the upstream and in the energy provision uh, and so on. Finally, we have Shea Makinde, who is the, um, who, uh, is the founder and GMD of the, of the Mekong Group, which works on project development and will be able to speak to some of the real, very real challenges that happens when it comes to actually building and developing the project. 
But Howard, let me start with you. Um, we heard uh, from, uh, from Mrs. Nwachukwu a, lot about, uh, a little bit about some of the kind of larger initiatives and projects happening um, in the energy space. Uh, can you give us a few minutes of your perspectives on that? Yeah, uh, with pleasure. I think it's uh, hard to underestimate, actually, the amount of international efforts that are being currently made to uh, ensure that the current electricity or power, power deficit in Africa is being uh, remedied. Uh, the keynote speaker uh, address or mentioned the Power Africa initiative. Uh, the US government, together with its partners, both in, within the country and outside, are making a sustained effort in a very organized way. For those of you who are interested in what uh, is happening in the sector, I commend to you the recently published roadmap from Power Africa, available free over the internet, which is a very impressive guide as to what's happening and the plans for the future. The EU has just uh, opened uh, requests for grants under its Electrify scheme, uh, so um, for people who want to have funding. Uh, the way Electrify has moved is it's not, certainly its first round is not looking for, to provide grants and funding very early on, but equally it's not waiting to effectively senior debt financial close. It's at a reasonable stage of development before they'll provide money. There's the IFC Scaling Solar Program, which is looking not at the funding, but looking at providing proper structures and, PP and to make sure that there are bankable PPAs. In fact, so bankable that if you're within a, in a scaling solar program, that the IFC itself will provide the debt funding to support the project development. The UN, under its umbrella of sustainable energy for all, has got a step-by-step -step approach to trying to deal with capacity issues. It's a three-step program. It's done what it calls rapid assessment and gap, gap analyses for a number of African countries to try and work out what the regulatory and technical constraints are that need to be fixed. And then it moves on, not at the moment only in relation to three countries, to come up with action agendas to try and deal with these problems. The national DFIs have done an extraordinary job in terms of providing debt. There are the senior debt type organizations, even though uh, some provide equity as well, such as FMO in Holland and the Emerging Africa Infrastructure Fund, who came together to provide money under the Uganda Get Fit program, which is a, obviously a structured approach to, with a set feed-in tariff to provide funding for renewable, solar renewables. And what's excellent, because we've already had highlighted the fact that power utilities are extremely weak in many, many African countries, is that the credit risk in relation to the utility was backstopped by KFW of Germany, and therefore taking away a lot of the credit worthiness issues to do with it. There's the African Development Bank's Africa Legal Support Facility, which is also providing capacity training. My firm is involved in providing capacity training in relation to making sure that power utilities in Africa understand the PPAs, what needs to go into them, and how they're structured. Infraco Africa, uh, one of the other organizations that are ultimately funded by donor agencies, is involved in providing funding from some of the very early stages of, of the project with a view to themselves exiting at financial close and therefore they're providing money to help put together bankable projects. So these are just a few of the examples, there are obviously more, but it's very impressive that people are looking at both the funding side because commercial <coughs> bank funding is going to be limited in this area uh, as well as trying to deal with the capacity issues. So, so, so based on that, Howard, um, clearly loads of stuff happening, a lot of in initiatives, a lot of engagement, yeah. obviously at different levels of scale, and, and quite a lot, of, uh, a lot of this getting a lot of, of media attention as well. Where is the biggest, where do you see the biggest bottleneck, you know, based on, on your experience on this? Uh, the, the biggest bottleneck, I personally think, is, if I can only name one, 
because lawyers, of course, like producing lots of lists of issues and problems, uh, I think is the in to do with early stage funding mm. to help put together and structure projects properly. Clearly, you need various parties, but David emphasised it in terms of mm. there's no shortage of ultimate senior debt funding if you've got a proper project. So once, once the project's bankable and, and kind of ready to, ready to go to market, it's fine. The question is, how do you take it from yeah. the early stage idea through kind of pre-feasibility and into the level where someone can come in and, and, and fund it? Yeah, and obviously, I don't want to spend too long about it, but the point is that there are lots of people with bright ideas who see opportunities. No pun intended. <laughs> but what they don't necessarily do is have the experience or the funding to take it through these days quite significant programs of, for example, all the environmental consultancy reports that need to happen in order to satisfy the senior debt providers that the projects are sufficiently environmentally friendly. Great. And I think we'll come back to that actually later in the conversation on all of the complexities of, of project development and, and delivery and so on. Um, Remy, you see this uh, you know, from, a, from, from a very different perspective, you know, being kind of having long experience working with SADC, which has, you know, for many years, has been quite successful at, at integrating power markets between, uh, be between countries, with kind of from the Mozambique to Zimbabwe to South Africa and so on. I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you see as, as, as the biggest questions facing, facing the continent in this area? Thank you very much, uh, our moderator. First, just to thank LOC for having counted us worthy to be part of this uh, galaxy of uh, eminent uh, persons uh, to engage in this uh, discourse this afternoon. Just to give you some perspectives around the regional approach uh, as espoused by the Southern African Development Community in terms of addressing uh, the issues of the energy challenge. Uh, I think our challenge basically uh, entails a number of issues. Firstly, is to ensure that uh, the supply side does meet the demand side, which we have failed to do for a long time. Currently in SADC, we're generating roughly about uh, 47,000 megawatts, and the demand uh, is up to about uh, 50,000 megawatts uh, during the peak times. Uh, and also over the years, we've engaged in a number of projects uh, generating an additional 2,000 megawatts each year uh, in the, into the region, but the uh, growth of the economies have been such that uh, we cannot meet the target. It's like uh, chasing a moving target, mm -hmm. and this has really been a, a bit of a problem. Uh, also, just to say that in terms of strategy, uh, what we adopted was that uh, our member states, of which there are 15 nations, uh, sat around and said, how do we address the energy challenge? Uh, the uh, strategy was basically to have what we call the regional uh, uh, energy security uh, strategy, which basically seeks at uh, uh, really taking, making use of the competitive advantage of the different nations as opposed to national energy security. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is really uh, motivated by uh, issues around uh, least cost options for the region because some of the projects uh, are low-hanging fruits, they are much cheaper, they are they are, they are much more huge, they can generate much more. Therefore, on that basis, we believe that uh, we needed really to come up with a short list of projects that could actually take us uh, to minimize the gap between demand and supply within the shortest period of time. And this also led the uh, institutionalization of the Southern Africa Power Pool, uh, which is really comprised of 12 members of SADAC on the continent, uh, nine of whom are connected, three are not, and we're still working on connecting them. But these are now called operating members, and essentially they're involved in power trading throughout the year, monitored by the Southern Africa Power Pool, based in Harare, which has got very sophisticated <coughs> equipment to broker uh, energy supply and trading amongst the members on a short-term basis, on a one-day basis, a weekly basis, and long-term. This is working very well, and we believe that uh, as we seek to uh, bridge the gap, will be able to continue with the energy trading so that all members uh, that have got surplus can actually sell to the others. Those that, those that have got deficit can in fact benefit from the same. I would also just want to add that um, uh, basically we uh, started off with what we call a pool plan, the SADAC pool plan, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically a compendium of projects uh, for generation, transmission, and interconnection, which are priority to ensure that as we actually generate, we're able to evacuate power uh, from the generating points to the load points across the region, and we believe that this is also working very well. Uh, but however, to do this, uh, these are obviously largely uh, cross-boundary projects, particularly those that uh, entail transmission, and uh, most of our countries would go into a uh, memorandum of understanding just to agree on uh, having a memorandum so that at least it's a, an indication of their willingness to undertake a project, and it underpins an agreement with partners that would like to implement. One of the issues we're looking at, again, of course, is to try and drop in as many independent power producers as is possible in the region uh, so that besides using 
using the fiscus to finance power uh, generation, we can also have the benefit of the private sector and relieve the government from the fiscal burden and attend to social issues. And we believe this is now really taking uh, shape. Uh, so at the end of the day, we believe this is going to be very helpful, but I just want to indicate that as a region, we've profiled or front-loaded industrialization as a key priority. And uh, based on that, what has been identified as a priority that supports industrialization is power, because mm -hmm. you can't industrialize without power. Yeah. And the second priority is transportation, particularly corridors, also supported by water supply and ICT. So again, this is a high priority activity within the region, and we believe it is important that uh, we pursue it. But in terms of investments, uh, we believe that as we are chasing a moving target, uh, by the year 2020, 2021, we'll be able to catch up with the target uh, so that we can have uh, demand and supply really being equalized. But more importantly, as a region, we took a decision that uh, we need to have a 15% reserve margin above, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the supply should be 15% more than the demand. So that any investors that would like to come to the region have got the comfort that they are going to uh, encounter adequate power supply upon investment in SADAC because uh, with the industrialization drive, I think this is pretty much uh, important. Uh, and in terms of strategies, just basically to give you a few challenges that we are facing, I think some of them have been mentioned. Uh, we talk about power purchase agreements. Uh, these have been difficult to secure. Uh, challenges in terms of investment uh, and also challenges of providing electricity to the uh, rural communities uh, have been abound. And also the challenges of member states wanting to focus on national projects as opposed to regional projects. Yeah. But these have been all, all essentially overcome. But we believe that uh, with this particular roadmap that we have, would like to invest uh, a huge amount of money, uh, probably about uh, 30 billion, so that we can have give and take an additional 40,000 megawatts by the year 2020, 2021. Our ministers have been dubbed the ministers without energy. Uh, those are energy ministers. We hope that in 2021, there'll be ministers with energy. So this is really the overall uh, perspective <laughs> around uh, the SADAC strategy, and we believe that uh, this model has been taken over to other regions. Uh, <coughs> just in conclusion to say that the Southern Africa Power Pool was established, uh, following which we then had the West African Power Pool, uh, Central African Power Pool, and they did the East African Power Pool. I think as an additional uh, initiative, uh, we are ensuring that we are getting interconnected with the East African Power Pool and the Central African Power Pool so that the trading is not only within SADAC, but mm -hmm. is also uh, uh, in the regional, given particularly the overlapping challenges and also the potential that is existing elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's very compelling, and, and I have to say, um, to, uh, achieving 15% reserve margin is something this country would be very happy with if they were able to achieve, achieve that. Um, just to, and I completely agree with you um, on, on your point around industrialization and job creation. It is, I, it's one of the really big topics, and whenever, whenever you speak to, to governments in African countries, they will mostly say that job creation is one of the, one of the most, most important targets they have, and power is, is so essential to that. McKinsey surveyed um, um, African businesses um, a few years ago, asking them about what were the biggest constraints to their development, and power and electricity was consistently one of the, one of the points that came up. But just building on your point around the kind of political economy and the, and, and the balance here between the, the obvious benefit of integration in terms of you know, choosing the lowest cost options and so on, and the, the desire of individual countries to be energy uh, independent and prioritize domestic projects. Um, any, do you have any, any thoughts for other regions in, in, in Africa as they think about uh, integrating their markets and, and learning from, from the SADC experience? I think one could say that uh, given our uh, phenomenon of uh, least cost options and uh, regional approach, uh, we still recognize as a region the national energy security for the long term, uh, essentially because uh, whatever happens, if a country has got surplus energy, it can only trade as long as it doesn't require it. We believe that in the long term, most of these countries will require this energy for themselves. So as much as we support uh, the regional projects uh, to a very large extent, we are also mindful of the need to capacitate other member states okay. so that they can move forward and over time they would be able to attain national energy security. Well, uh, what we take into account is the fact that uh, even though you're trading, you need the money to be able to buy, uh, you also need foreign currency. There's challenges uh, within the trading uh, platform. So essentially, uh, we believe that this whole issue is a uh, short to medium term issue, but in the long term, we'd want to see as many countries attain uh, national energy security as, as much as is possible. Okay, so there is a balance here between, on the one hand, encouraging integration and trading, and on the other hand, ensuring that all countries have at least some level of, some level of, of independence. Okay, now that's, a, that, that's very interesting. 
Um, Ernest, uh, one of the points that was highlighted by Remy, and which I think also has come through here, is, is the need for the private sector to play a critical role in all of this. Because you know, I think we heard it very compellingly, and, and certainly uh, with no doubt uh, from, from his side, from the previous panel, around the relationship between government and business. And, and the power sector is obviously always uh, works at the intersection between the two. But can you say a little bit about your experiences in, in Nigeria work, working in, in, in this area? Thank you, Martin. Um, I will. I want uh, to apologize for my, you know, for a cracked voice because um, I think I'm been having issues with my voice since yesterday I arrived in London. So I uh, please forgive me if you are. You I'm not going to ask what you did last night. Um, <laughs> then, uh, Martin, um, actually, you. Uh, I would like to introduce myself uh, properly. I know sometimes my, you know, the, the surnames are a bit difficult for some people. Uh, my name is uh, Ernest Azodialo Obiejesi. Azodialo Obiejesi. So I'm sure Martin, you try. <laughs> so thank you very much. I want to, um, first of all, thank the LSC organizing committee for um, inviting me. Uh, it wasn't easy getting my chief of staff, Ama, to you know, battle me all the way from Nigeria to London at this time when we are all going through um, a lot of problems in the oil and gas um, business all over the world. Um, the, my contribution will be you know, limited um, to uh, private sector participation in uh, uh, power uh, Africa. Um, as a man who runs as the CEO of the OB Jackson Group, and the company most people are quite uh, familiar with uh, the flagship of the group, Nest Oil, uh, PLC, um, <coughs> I, I drive the formulation, the implementation, and of the of the policies, you know, in that uh, group. I also preside over the organization's uh, operations, which cover the fields of oil and gas pipeline construction, for gas transportation, uh, oil and gas exploration, major steel fabrications, pressure vessel manufacturing in Nigeria, power generation and distribution, dredging and then um, aviation. We also um, have some uh, uh, instincts into uh, uh, telecoms just a few years ago. Most of us here are either extensively well read or have some first hand knowledge about the challenges with power on the continent. From two out of three uh, people in Africa has no access to electricity and how power is connected to the total development of the continent among the vital facts and figures. As an African businessman with the personal mantra of ensuring I contribute my quota in economically empowering Africans, the challenges with energy puts a damper on ensuring we are the masters of our destiny. How, how does this happen? How do we, as a, as a continent, make sure that the power we generate in one country gets to another country? How do we share power among the regional um, governments or countries within Africa? Yes, sometimes or in the, in the recent past, some of these things has happened, but in a very low scale. For example, I know Nigeria uh, still um, gives power to Ghana, to um, Niger, and Chad. Yes, but why do Nigeria do that? Nigeria uses uh, water uh, from uh, um, Niger, and charge to power is a hydro electricity. And in return, they give electricity to them. The same thing also applies to supply of gas to Ghana. So it would be good for, for, for the African regional governments to start looking extensively into how to share the power that is generated by one country to another, without actually allowing each country to go and invest heavily in uh, pipeline construction transportation of gas, which sometimes some of those countries do not have. Because from a, a businessman's point of view, it is easy to build transmission lines that to construct uh, um, uh, gas, um, gas pipelines. Electricity, electricity can increase household per capita income by 30% across the continent. There is an urgent need to tap into new sources of generation, as well as build on existing power infrastructure. Anyone who knows the challenges of the continent knows that from government stronghold on energy provision from the early days of independence 
to mismanagement among others. Energy planning hasn't happened. As a people, we haven't aligned our energy needs to infrastructural development in this sector. Personally, I ponder some fundamental questions. One, how can we ensure funding in an enabling environment, especially with regards to commitment from all key stakeholders? Make sure that this happens and happens quickly. How do we align private sector commitment and government's commitment as governments has the lion's share of responsibility in developing Africa's energy needs? I will want to talk about renewable energy because over some of the discussions, um, not necessarily in this, uh, in this hall, but people talk about renewable energy in Africa. My own way of looking at it is that I will look at Africa as where we are first of all going to survive by making sure we have electricity generated from the traditional power generation using gas and carbon, uh, coal and all that than going into the renewable energy um, uh, issues now. Yes, I know Africa is going to get there, but in Africa where most people do not have access to electricity, it becomes very difficult to tell people, tell uh, private sector um, people and government to go into renewable energy when we know that renewable energy is almost one and a half or two times the cost of the traditional power generation. Africa may not afford to do renewable energy the way we are talking about it now. And I also want to say that it will, not, it will be a lot of struggle you know, for, for government to continue uh, participating you know, in businesses where private sector uh, initiatives have thrived and succeeded, even in Western world. Because, you know, because for example, the, the, in Nigeria today, one of the first uh, energy savings uh, building that we have is the next oil towers. Most of the buildings in Africa do not have, they are not energy compliant, talk less of saving energy. So they need enormous amount of energy or power for us to be able to have the electricity like the Western world. Such building is just the first one and it's in West Africa. So why, how is it possible that homes and um, businesses or buildings should be able to talk about power savings and all that, when actually many people in Africa do not have electricity. So even see or read, most people still use lanterns and you know, stuff in, the, in, the, in these villages. So I believe that it will be good for, for us to be looking at some of these things a little bit um, differently. But also, looking at um, the US government energy program, you know, uh, Power Africa, it says that the private, se private investors have committed over 20 billion to various energy projects. Century Power, a subsidiary of OB Jackson Group, which I am the president, has learned firsthand the challenges of adding 495 megawatts of electricity to Nigerian power. Constructing a power plant, uh, a power plant in Anambra State, Okija, uh, for, for, uh, for addition to the national you know, grid. I'm looking forward to sharing my experiences in this regard and also hearing from other colleagues in this panel right. and the expertise in this room on how we can all jointly ensure the dark continent no longer carries that tag. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Shay, um, your company um, is primarily in working in the EPC space, and so is responsible for the, the development, the delivery of a lot of the projects that actually, you know, actually will deliver the power that other people talk about financing and paying for and, and so on. i um, be really interested to hear about your experiences in this area and what you see as the kind of opportunities to, 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 to make sure that projects get delivered on time and on budget, because as we know, uh, this, is a, this is a major, major constraint. Well, thank you, uh, Martin. First, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers you know, for having me uh, here. But you guys have two problems uh, to contend with, uh, uh, with me. Uh, one is uh, I speak with you by an accent. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I speak slowly, so I, I'm sorry, but that's how it's going to be. <laughs> well, it's uh, actually more of uh, uh, the mine owners, you know, like Seplat, uh, even Ernest, you know, sometimes I call them the mine owners versus the guy with the, the shovels and the diggers, you know. Uh, it's the same projects, but the way they look at it are quite uh, different. It's almost like me, you know, in a cab, <coughs> sorry, being driven by my wife. Uh, we're approaching uh, a traffic light, and then I see the light turning from, you know, green to amber, you know, and then she speeds up. I said, what did you see? He said, well, I better, you know, pass through before it turns red. <laughs> Whereas for me, what I see is, you know, you need to slow down because it's going to uh, uh, turn red. <laughs> Sometimes the way the project promoters, they look at uh, the project are quite different from the way uh, the executors uh, are going to look at it. Well, of course, whether it's uh, uh, upstream, downstream, or power project, uh, the basic issues that we're faced with are, one, it's over budget, and two, they are behind schedule. So I, I take uh, two broad uh, ways of looking at this. You have the technical uh, issues, uh, which are really uh, very easy to fix. Uh, you have issues of standards. Uh, we work with the, uh, uh, with the oil majors. They have their own standards. I haven't seen, you know, local uh, 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 standards like, let's say, for NNPC or for uh, Sonagal in, in Angola. They kind of adopt the standard, you know, from the IOCs. If uh, Total is uh, running the project, they adopt Total uh, standard. Uh, if uh, Shell is running the project, they adopt uh, Shell's uh, standard. Uh, those are major uh, <coughs> problems because it eventually helps to the cost, you know. Uh, uh, if you have a normal international standard uh, uh, project, you tend to have a, a lower cost compared to where, uh, you know, Shell says, oh, we want this gold plated and, and all of that, or Total says, we want this gold plated. So you can easily fix it. But the major ones that uh, uh, it's good that at least I can see the governor of Lagos State here, I can see His Excellency, the former Vice President of Nigeria here, because I'm going to touch on some projects that actually happened during their time that we're still, uh, uh, you know, battling with uh, uh, right now. You have the funding uh, inconsistency, is what I call the pay-as-you-go uh, mentality, uh, or start-stop, start, -stop start uh, syndrome. Uh, when you start a project and you're not able to, you know, uh, basically efficiently take it to the end. It has to uh, force the project being uh, delayed and also the cost is going to mount. Uh, uh, one of the projects that uh, uh, we have worked with is uh, a big gas supply, uh, a, a gas uh, supply project, uh, a gas to power project. It's supposed to supply 150 million scores uh, of gas to the uh, power grid, uh, to the gas grid, and uh, in electricity terms, that's about uh, 600 uh, megawatts. Mm -hmm. If we take that to the national uh, uh, generation capacity in Nigeria, that's about 15 to 20 percent of the national uh, uh, capacity. Uh, first, we, yeah, we started the project, it was supposed to be sited somewhere, and then they find out that uh, uh, the natural gas in that area will not be enough to uh, make the project economy to work well. So it was relocated to another uh, site. And at this site, we found out that the gas in there got uh, CO2. So you move from you know, a, a regular carbon steel plant to where you need to use uh, exotic uh, uh, materials. How do we then handle uh, the issue of uh, real-time scope changes? Because the gestation period to even have the, uh, to have the project uh, uh, approved in the first uh, instance is uh, close to 18 months. It's 18 months in Nigeria. Angola, wi which is about the standard for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, is about uh, six months. Even at six months, a lot could happen, you know, 
uh, uh, in the international uh, community that the issue of funding that they're talking about, you know, it may completely change uh, 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 those issues. Uh, during uh, His Excellency's time as the Vice President, a lot of uh, power projects, you know, were uh, awarded. So they built all those uh, power plants. This was <coughs> having like uh, 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 eight, nine years ago. They were built, but we don't have uh, uh, power, we don't have uh, uh, gas mm -hmm. to uh, uh, those uh, power plants. So if you have to efficiently run a project, you need to, I mean, really go from end to end. You have the uh, uh, power purchase agreement which was signed, but you didn't have the gas aggregation agreement because the gas aggregation agreement is supposed to, at the back end, uh, uh, ensure that you have a, a a gas supply to the power plant, and also uh, it will ensure that you also have a, a bankable project, you know, all across. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, some of the major uh, challenges that uh, we have, and of course uh, uh, you have the issue of a knowledge gap as well. Uh, you need expertise. Uh, uh, you need people to cooperate, you know, across uh, technology. Uh, what we've seen uh, out there is. Uh, Macon has offices in South Africa and also in the U.S. And why did we set up uh, uh, in South Africa? Uh, the major motivation for us was the fact that we saw customers in Ghana, you know, they prefer to fly to Johannesburg to discuss projects as opposed to come to Lagos. <laughs> <laughs> and we've also had issues, uh, I think it was a uh, Seplat. Uh, we're going to commission uh, a gas plant for them at uh, Obe. And uh, they prefer to cut a purchase order to ABB in Houston, who in turn, you know, uh, 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 just turn it around and give it to us, you know. So. Um. <laughs> Very good. Well, I, I think I think it, just to sort of briefly summarize, sum, summarize, because I think these are you're touching on kind of incredibly important points here, which is that. When we talk about the challenges of electrifying Africa, right? when we talk about the challenges of scaling up, we tend to think of them very much as large-scale strategic questions. And we talk about financing, and we talk about the regulatory regime, and all of that. And these are very important points, right? But at the same time, like, and, and I know, especially as you sit in, in London at the very nice auditorium at the LSE, um, far removed from you know, the details of laying a gas pipeline across the Niger Delta or you know, building, building a, a coal plant in, you know, in, in northern South Africa and so on. The, the extraordinary challenges of the day-to-day -day project development that can have huge implications, as you said, scope changes to you know, where a pipeline should go that end up adding 18 months to the timeline. I mean, these 18 months is 18 months that a power plant is not going to have access to gas, and therefore that people will not have access to power, right? So, so I think as, you know, these are, I think it just highlights to me that, you know, there are some real operational challenges in this, right, that I imagine you guys deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, well, we, we, we got involved with uh, 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 Chad Cameroon pipeline uh, projects, and we also got involved with West Africa gas pipeline projects. Uh, he was talking about, you know, uh, uh, int regional integration, mm -hmm. yeah? I had to send engineers to uh, Chad. They had to first of all from Lagos fly to Paris and then back to Chad. <laughs> uh, whereas, or, okay, I think uh, sometimes uh, in the course of that project, uh, Ethiopian airlines started flying from, uh, I think, Lagos to Addis Ababa, but you see, fly over Chad, you know, and then come back uh, uh, in uh, whichever direction that, uh, uh, that you go. So if they take into consideration, I mean, just like I mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, uh, when it comes to the nuts and bolts uh, of all of this, if uh, 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 generating, uh, power generating uh, plants are being built, and then if uh, the people if the people you know, uh, that are saddled with the responsibility of developing those uh, projects, um, they can see uh, you know, all across the spectrum, then the issue of uh, gas supply, the issue of, uh, of course, uh, you have uh, uh, sometimes issues with the community uh, 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 because they, you have to bring them on board, let them buy into the project, let them not see uh, uh, it as uh, uh, you know, just something uh, uh, woolly on top of 
of, uh, on top of their head. No, there's a large number of interconnected issues. Um, we're going to turn to questions from the panel, but before I do that, just uh, from, you know, these the, some of the reflections on kind of the project development and, and the regional challenges. Do you, I mean, do you guys have any, any thoughts or comments on that? All I would say is that, you know, these big projects that have been referred to are obviously complete game changers. They can also take several decades in the planning and the execution. And we all know that anything which is absolutely enormous there are all kinds of things that can get in the way that can turn a decade into two decades or ensure it never happens. I personally would like to see more progress in terms of momentum. And therefore, I personally am a great believer in smaller projects which are scalable so that you can do a project and try and overcome that, but the amounts of money and indeed the political issues and the technical issues are not insurmountable. They're manageable, everybody can understand them. And if the project is implemented, you then effectively build a second plant, you know, you scale it up, or you can see what went right and what went wrong in one part of the country, hopefully enough went right, you can then do it in other parts of the country. I think the massive projects are clearly mind-blowing but they're actually, by and large, often rather impractical. So we, we shouldn't all sit around and wait for Grandinga, is what you're saying? Okay. No, that, that, that is, I think that is a very, very, very good point. Um, um, Remy. Yep, just to add, uh, I think from our own experience, uh, our focus uh, in terms of the mandate that we've been given by our member states is to uh, focus largely on project preparation that is subsequent to the uh, finalization of the pool plan. Uh, and we believe that uh, uh, I think the project preparation part of it is very, very important because that becomes our marketing tool in terms of uh, bankable project. But I think uh, uh, there was mention earlier about pre-project preparation. Uh, I think of late we've realized that uh, our member states have difficulties bringing up a project to a position where it can then have its final preparation. So uh, in conjunction with the African Union and NEPAD, we are now working a lot on the pre-project uh, preparation part of it. I think one of the pertinent issues uh, which is real across Africa is the issue of cost reflective tariffs mm -hmm. uh, in terms of impact on projects. Uh, inside that we recognize that uh, because we don't have cost reflective tariffs for political reasons, uh, then we took a decision in 2007 that we should move to cost reflective tariffs in five years. Come 2012, we said who has done so? Three member states have done so. Uh, so again, we need to continue to help them. But the issue now is, if you want the private sector to come, they've got to have cost-reflective tariffs. If you want the utilities to operate efficiently, they have also have to have cost-reflective tariffs. So this message is thinking uh, clearly, uh, but, uh, but, but from time to time. Uh, so we believe that uh, at the end of the day, we'll be able to address these issues. Uh, the final issue is to do with uh, enabling environment, because as you undertake a project, you need an enabling environment where you have got your harmonized policies, uh, legislation, and also uh, you've got your regulatory framework. As for SADC, we've established the uh, Regional Electricity Regulators Association, which then ensures the domestication of agreed provisions in terms of uh, regulation because all investors would find this pretty much uh, useful. But finally, it's, it's to do with maintenance. We seem to focus a lot on projects uh, implementation but we do not give a lot of emphasis on ensuring capacity building for maintenance. Uh, a lot of the projects we're undertaking are actually rehabilitation, primarily because we didn't have people that are uh, capacitated to undertake sustainable maintenance. So we need to draw a balance between new projects and old projects. Otherwise, we'll continue to have shortages, we'll be continuing to run around. So these are some of the challenges that we continue to grapple with. I think these are all very important and very relevant points. Uh, listen, we could, I think the, between the five of us, we could keep this conversation going for hours and hours. And I would certainly enjoy that. But I, and, but I think we, people will want to move on as well. And I'm sure there are loads of questions in the room. Um, why don't we start? Um, over here with the lady in, in purple. We have a shortage of, of, of women on the panel, so I think I might uh, need to ask some, <laughs> ask, uh, prioritize women in, in, um, among the questions. questions. Okay, good afternoon. Um, when it comes to electrifying Africa, one pertinent issue that comes to mind um, is vandalism. It's displayed on the headlines of newspapers. So what it shows, what indicates is that people in the communities where the pipelines or the sources of you know, electricity, are, it's located, um, do not have a stake. So what can governments in Africa do about this? Thank you. Great, I think that sounds like a really good question from our, our, our friend on the, on the right hand side here. 
Well, um, yes, I did mention uh, community uh, issues uh, uh, and also ensuring that uh, the communities, they actually have uh, a stake, you know, in the project. You know, just go into the community and then you go there, execute it uh, uh, without uh, consideration for them. Uh, but I got married into the Niger Delta community. And, uh, that, that's proper integration, I think. Uh, I'm not sure we can expect all project developers to do that. Well, it has assisted me, really. <laughs> to, to have their perspective, you know, into uh, our project uh, delivery within those uh, uh, communities. And what I would say is uh, it's extremely important uh, that those communities, you know, they, they have uh, a sense of belonging. Uh, we're executing a project for an IOC, and uh, we said to them that uh, these communities, you know, they see you flare this gas, and then they see you power your own uh, uh, plant. You know, uh, also you power, you know, from those uh, plants, obviously, uh, they power their, uh, their accommodation and all of that. And then they live almost like a first world in the middle of uh, 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 a third world. And if uh, there's any agitation within the community, the first thing they do is to shut down the, uh, the facility. So we said to them that, okay, from this facility, why don't you supply them power, <coughs> supply them uh, 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 water, you know, and then they'll think twice you know, uh, before they will come in and shut uh, down the, uh, uh, the plant. And really, it has assisted because now they dialogue more, you know, before they just uh, go out and, and shut down the community. So I think it's extremely important to have, you know, the communities uh, uh, being carried along. And again, you can extend it to uh, the cost of the project. If you, the less uh, community issues that you have, uh, the less shutdown you have on your project, uh, uh, you know, the more you meet your, uh, uh, delivery target and also your budget uh, targets. Uh, yeah. Martin, yes. I did like to also point out that um, the, when you talk about the facility or the, the power plant, it's just where it's uh, situated. But you know, for a power plant to happen, there is a lot of other facilities you need to build, like the, power, the pipelines and all that for the gas. You see, the communities along these lines okay, need to be managed a little bit differently because um, just like my friend who married uh, from the from the community, <laughs> yes, I, I, yes, I married from a, a community that is not in the Niger Delta, and what that means is that for the for the biggest pipeline that is being built in Nigeria today for gas, uh, which is the uh, the OB3 pipeline project, it's one of the biggest pipelines I think ever constructed in that part of the world. The communities are seriously asking for a stake, but what we what we are doing is the pipeline for the federal government to be able to transport gas from different oil fields through, get the, across Nigeria, even to the north. So how do you get these people to stop vandalizing some of these things? I think that looking at some of the issues that the government you know, has actually uh, tried to um, stop or tried to improve, like the documentation, like uh, the CFOs, and even consent to mortgage to some of these companies, is what will bring these communities into being part owners of this project. How, do, how are you going to do that? There is what we call right of way. Every community wants you to pay for the land through which the pipe will pass before it gets to the power plant. How are you going to be paying for every community from one <laughs> part of Nigeria <laughs> to the other? So the go yes, government has challenge on that one, but we believe that the best way to do it is for government to enlighten these communities more. Let them understand that these power plants are also for them. It's not oil. It's not that somebody is going to sell any crude and make money. This is power coming to the community. And also, government should encourage this captive power thing where if a power plant is to be built in a place, the area surrounding that area or the, those routes, there must be some amount of power that will be given to them, not putting everything in national grid. For example, the one we're building in Anambra State, we have told the government that, look, this every town around Okija, Newi, Onisha, have to get power from this power plant. Then we put the rest in the national grid. 
so that by telling them that the communities are now willing to give lands. Mm. And when they give you these lands, the issue of the governor issuing CFO will be a lot more easier. Because the governor can issue the CFO and the guys will say you can't construct. So I think to address your question directly, the, these issues also has to align with the way the government manages some of this information and the community. Because I'm sure we have quite good uh, representation of Nigerian government here. We have a former vice president, <laughs> and we have a serving governor in the, in the biggest city in Nigeria. Okay? So, you know, by, by looking at this, some of these issues, they will, the government should be able to, you know, develop policies and issues that, you know, how to address the issues of uh, the community, participating in power projects, and the facilities that, you know, that leads to power generation. Thank you, thank, you, thank you very much. We have a, another question over here from the lady in blue. Thank you very much. Um, the oil and gas business in Nigeria, I don't know about other parts of Africa, is about the most lucrative business in the world because you have the names of all these, uh, our oil magnates uh, in Forbes magazine as the richest people in the world. <laughs> and yet, Nigeria is significantly underpowered. And the average man has reserved, resigned himself, average man or woman, to using uh, firewood, uh, for cooking and uh, coal, which my grandmother used many years ago, and I my, passed it on to my mother, and I passed it on down to my children. How where, how, where are we going after this? How can people be making so much money, and yet the people who actually need to be fed and clothes are suffering. <laughs> if we were in Nigeria, where the oil magnates are seated on the high table, students cannot even enter the room, not to talk about rubbing shoulders with them and addressing them. And old people like me are relegated to the background. We have accepted our lot, but it was heartwarming. A couple of days ago in Metro newspaper here in England, where I've been living since I retired from government work, there is a community somewhere in Somerset where human urine is used to power electricity. So I was wondering if we can pass the same message to Nigeria. <laughs> The newspaper article. I didn't know I was coming here to ask all our men who drink palm wine and beer to donate their urine so that we can have electricity. The average Abba trader, if he had his way, he would have called the Lord Jesus Christ to turn water into gas and oil so that the people can have gas in their control. We don't need petrol anymore. <laughs> we can all start walking. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm glad that you've given us the opportunity to be amongst this distinguished and esteemed men of timber and caliber. Thank you. Right. I'm not sure. right. I'm not I, I, I'm not, I'm not. Thank you very much. I'm not sure that that counts as a question, but I think, it very, I think it was a very valuable intervention that we should all, we should all keep in mind, and the contrast between the riches uh, uh, of, 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 the, of industry and, and the, the, the poverty next door is definitely one of, one of the big reasons for, for electrifying Africa. Um, I think we have five more minutes. Um, we have a question um, over, over here, gentleman with the blue shirt on the Can I, for, for the remainder of the questions, remind uh, of my old professor's adage that a question is, it starts with them telling you who you are, 
It is short and ends with a question mark. <laughs> um, good afternoon. I'm Falavia Oru from Imperial College London. Um, I was just asking, you mentioned the cost-effective tariff. How do you balance that with affordability? Because I'm sure you Nigerians on the panel, just for example, in recent weeks, there, there was talk of them increasing the tariff and there was a massive uproar from the masses who couldn't afford these new electricity prices. So how do you compromise, or how do you balance the, the increase in the tariff with regards to affordability for the masses? Let's take, great question. Let's take one or two more and then we'll do a, uh, then we'll do a round of the panel because we're, we're running, we, we have about five minutes left. So there's a question over here. Thank you very much. My name is Daniel Bankolea Filaka. I'm into uh, project finance and project management. Um, my question goes to the operator, Shego Makinde and Ernest in particular. Um, every project must have a finite period. As of 1981, Nigeria, and I'm using this because I'm a Nigerian, Nigeria had headlines saying, power will soon come. <laughs> this is 2015. Um, it might sound, I mean 16, it might sound hilarious, but we're still saying the same thing. So from a project perspective, do you have a finite period when your power project would end and then people will see power? And I'll just dovetail, dovetail that into another one, which says, I'm sure you have an idea of what your competitors are doing. So have you guys sat down to even think about or tell us exactly when is Nigeria gonna have power? So from a project finance perspective, we can tell the world that they can rule that out of the project risks related to financing projects in Nigeria. Thank you. Let's take one more, and there's uh, over, over there a lady with, gray, with a gray shirt. Thank you very much. My name is Laito Mankole from LSE. Um, I just want to say with uh, this is it's a unique situation in Africa. We're coming up. Uh, I'm going to take on the comment where you said uh, you are more or less advocating for coal power because it's cheaper and most people don't have light. But I think that's counterintuitive because we need to start thinking long term. We already don't have light. We've not had light for the past 50 years. I, have, I wasn't born in an era where there was light. So can we please think of effective solutions, long term solutions, renewable sources, and factor, I mean, you guys can get people together to think of cheap ways and effective ways to bring those kind of energy sources online, not coal in 2016. All right. All right. We have, uh, so we only have a couple of minutes, and I want to I keep the time because there is another panel afterwards. Uh, can I suggest that, uh, that Remy answers the question about uh, uh, cost-reflective tariffs and fairness, um, that you maybe address the issue of, of renewables and, and non-coal uh, energy, and that um, our friends over here, uh, both Ernest and, and Jay, can talk a little bit about the project timeline. But let's, please, keep, please keep your answers short. Thank you very much. Uh, with regard to cost-effective tariffs, uh, obviously this is a challenge uh, because the affordability uh, is different across the consuming uh, <coughs> spectrum. Uh, but and it's also a policy uh, space kind of issue. Uh, in terms of uh, issues of addressing this particular challenge, uh, what has happened is that uh, we've impressed on the governments to uh, disaggregate consumers. Uh, those that require subsidies, those subsidies must come from the government uh, so that any such tariffs that are charged uh, around them are subsidized by the government. But however, the utility continues to receive uh, the appropriate uh, revenue in terms of cost-reflective tariffs uh, for that particular consumption. Uh, the other issue we've also done is that uh, we have created models around <coughs> rural electrification, uh, and we've got these universal funds, uh, which are accessible for uh, rural communities, which the government can then use to ensure that uh, you power up the rural communities, and that whatever charges that they are, they are, they are applicable are also subsidized charges. Otherwise, it's difficult for you to have cost-reflective tariffs within a community that is not receiving revenue or receiving very little revenue. So this is really uh, the manner in which uh, the government have addressed uh, these disparities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Howard. Um, obviously, if you're looking for, you know, clean energy supplies with money, no object, then you <coughs> probably need to think around all the issues to do with whether you need to have a nuclear power solution. The reality is that there is a massive need for additional power in rural and urban communities throughout Africa, 
and therefore you really need to have an, an energy mix which is going to deliver sustainable power in as short a reasonable time as is possible. And while, power, while coal power is clearly a dirty solution, if there is a lot of coal that's available nearby and is actually going to deliver the, uh, the power that the communities need, which is going to clearly have a transformational effect, then you need to have the cleanest, in my view, humble view, the cleanest coal space solution that you need to. But have a mix and look at how the, how the technologies and the costs balance up. To say that you can only have solar power or you can only have coal power, I think is not really the right approach to this issue. Right, so, so not so like, like uh, Winnie the Pooh when he was asked if he wanted milk, um, milk uh, or honey. He said, yes, please, both. <laughs> All right. Yes, um, um, yes Martin, I, I, I did like to answer the question of um, the gentleman who asked about when will the power come in. I guess. <laughs> See, the one thing you need to get very clear is that um, Nigeria has actually, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not part of government. I don't work for government, but haven't been around, you know, for the past 30 years doing business. I can tell you that Nigeria, for example, has moved on the power sector. But that movement, for example, Azura, you heard here, just started construction. Azura took six years of signing documents and getting through, <laughs> getting through government bureaucracy and, you know, different organizations that monitor power in Africa, including the World Bank. So it is not a question, it's not an answer you can just get like Nigeria will get power tomorrow. But what has happened also is that the government, apart from trying to divest from power business and handing over to the private sector, they still need to go further to look at those bodies that control the, the power, the licenses, the permits and all that. Because some of these bodies are just like new, new establishments. They have not tried some of these things in the past. So government has to look at the way of shortening the time it takes for these things to happen. It's well only when they do that then people like us that are already about three years in the Okeja power plant, but we have not even gotten to financial close. We are three years already signing documents, coming to London, going back, and for meeting with Standard Chartered Bank, every bank and all that. <laughs> and we are just three years, and we are hoping to go, you know, go faster than Azura. Azura that took six years. They've started construction. So we hope to start our constru you know, construction maybe in the next one year, in the next one and a half in Okeja. So Nigeria, I believe, will, you know, I mean, it's on the right track because some of these things are not as simple as a lot of people look at it. Generating power is not like buying granite. And when we talk, <laughs> when we talk, when we talk about, <laughs> sorry, I did, I did like, I did like to mention, I did like to mention that, you know, for the young lady who said we need to go cleaner, solar, and all that. Yes, Africa, Nigeria, we want to go solar, we want to go all that. But you just you can only say it when you are in London. Or you can say it because you are born here. In Africa, we need to first of all use our gas, which we have abundantly in most countries, to generate power. It's clean. We need to use. We need to go carbon. We need to get. We, we need to use coal to generate, you know, power. Because mm. even coal, yep. the coal we have in Africa, especially like Nigeria, is sulfur. You know, very low in sulfur content. So you, you you don't have to be looking at solar because you read it in the in the you know in the books. <laughs> we are first hand. We are on ground as a local company. As a local company, we've been involved in this things practically, and we have devoted our own times, devoted our own times in making sure that these things happen locally. So it is not easy the way a lot of people look at it, but practically this is going to happen. But it's just taking a little bit of time. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much, Ernest. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, I think your point ties in very well with the investment climate discussion we had in the previous panel. Uh, very briefly, Seiji, and then we, 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 people want to break for some coffee. So uh, you're, you're standing between these people and their coffee. So. Okay. Well, it's going to be very brief. I think uh, uh, what you all need to do uh, really is uh, get involved. Uh, even though I am an engineer, I'm a professional. Uh, I did, uh, I contested uh, to be the governor of Royal State in the last uh, election. I called you guys our expatriate uh, children. If the expatriate children, you know, with all the knowledge that they have in here, if you're ready to, you know, uh, come back uh, uh, home, 
to assist, come to the continent. Uh, some of the knowledge that you've acquired here, of course, uh, with uh, African money, because they kept sending money here to the center. <laughs> uh, if you bring all of those back, I think uh, we will have uh, the chance uh, to actually uh, move uh, Africa forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's an, that's an excellent conclusion to the panel. And uh, you can all, during the break, go and talk to Charles and his friends that move me back and figure out how you can all get um, a job in la Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, please, just before you go, I would like to thank all members of the panel for their respective inputs, which were indeed very valuable. Martin, Ernest, Howard, Shea, and Remy. And I'd also like to thank the lady in the audience who uh, gave us the idea of possibly uri using urine <laughs> to generate power. And I couldn't help speculating that if that were indeed feasible, you know, whenever the lights went out, you'd look around the room and say, quickly, can somebody <laughs> urine? <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you. And um, we're now going to have a very short uh, tea coffee break, just 10 minutes. And then please return promptly because there'll be a keynote address by His Excellency. Thank you. <laughs>